Welcome to the Blooming League of Original Podcast. Hello and welcome to an extra educational edition of Thrash and Treasure, the torture chamber musical comedy podcast that wears leather pants to the pantaloon ball. And speaking of pants, loons, and balls, I'm Mr. J Wags, Jonathan Wagner, joined as usual by the man voted most likely to nap, the man who was Melbourne this way. Let's hope we can wake up. Aaron, where, everybody? Hey, hey, thank you. <laughs> so, what it says, listeners at home, it says Aaron the village idiot, but Jonathan was too nice to call me village. Far too smart to call you village idiot. I think you're brilliant and know a lot about stuff, and that's why you talk into the microphone and the people listen. That's how smart I am. I just set up a compliment for me. Right at the start of the show, but anyway. <laughs> I know, it made it sound just so natural, it flows straight out of my normal talking. Anyway, uh, Aaron, how are you doing today, in this cold, weary morning in Australia? I'm pretty good. My back's still sore. If listeners were listening last week, I was complaining about my back. Then I go to the doctor and I forgot my Medicare card, and I'm like, I don't have time to go home, find it, come back, do the appointment, get my x-ray on, on my spine, come home, eat, and then go to bed, and wake up in time for this appointment. And they're like, well, how about Friday? And I'm like, no, I've got another recording on Friday night. Well, how about about Wednesday and I'm like no I've got a recording next Wednesday as well like can you access your phone can you get your Medicare card on your phone no because I don't have a sim card like I'm standing there looking like the biggest idiot in the world and my back is still sore I just love it's the dichotomy of like I have too many recordings also my phone doesn't have a sim card <laughs> Yeah, like you know, that producer life. I know, right? I like don't I look like a well organized producer, but anyway, it's just a quick update. Spencer would have had his show by now. I'm so proud. Just on Sunday, I caught Nelson Aspen's opening of his Tony Bennett cabaret. So if any of you are in New York and have not had a chance to get out to Green Room 42 to see that, there are three more of those, and it is Oh, wonderful. Anyway, thank you for going. Guess what? What? We have another legendary lyrical diva back in school today. So let's educate the children, take a leap of faith into a bucket of blood for a splash with the Little Mermaid and her 12 sister act. So please help us American housewives throw a huge American howdy over to the home on the range so we can gallivant with the ugly dolls in a place called Slaughter Race. But before we get tangled up in a Bronx tale, let's head over to the great beyond and welcome back to the chamber this Brooklyn born boy who bolstered my big Broadway debut. So we've rebooted the School of Rock because it is the brilliant Glenn Slater. Yay. Hey. <laughs> Happy to be here. How the heck are you doing today? What's what's going on in the world of Glenn? Uh, it's all good. Dealing with the New York summer heat and working away on the next batch of projects. Anything you can talk about right now? Or are you one of those people who doesn't like to discuss until it's, it's out? You know, I can talk about some of it. I've got a new animated film coming out in November called Spellbound with music by Alan Menken. I've heard of it. Which is pretty exciting. It's a Skydance animation film produced by John Lasseter, yep. previously of Disney and Pixar. And nice. it is a spectacular cast with a great score and a pretty fascinating world that we've created. So looking forward to that. That's going to be out? It's a co-production with Netflix. So I think it's going to have like a couple of weeks in theaters and then it's going to be on Netflix. November 22. November 22. Got Rachel Zegler, Nicole Kidman, and Harvey A. Bardem, and John Lithgow, and Jennifer Lewis, the mother of mm -hmm. Black Hollywood, and yes. Nathan and Lane. Oh my God, Andre De Shields yes. and Jordan Fisher. Plus, I know it's pretty astonishing. Then I head to London for the West End premiere of Clueless, the musical, Ooh. Uh, which I'm writing with KT Tunstall, the pop star, doing the music. Yes. And uh, Amy Heckerling, who wrote and directed the original film, doing the script. And that's pretty exciting. Uh, so we start rehearsals at the very beginning of January and then open, I think, in March, early March. Oh, wow. right. I'm absolutely bugging for that one. Sister Act the Musical will be opening in Sydney uh, this month. Will you be going out for the opening? I, you know what? I, I would desperately love to. I don't think I can fit that huge flight back and forth into my current schedule, unfortunately. But I've never been to Sydney. I've never been to Australia, and I'm dying to go. Do Melbourne. Come to Melbourne instead. And you could be my hot date for it, Glenn. <laughs> but not that I have been invited. But Yeah, I, but we're really looking forward to it. And it sounds like an amazing cast in Sydney, so that should be really fun. Well, uh, speaking of which, Casey Donovan is such a brilliant and inspired choice for our listeners at home. 20 years ago in 2004 she won Australian Idol as a 16 year old and I do remember when she walked in that room and she was a metalhead and she had her dreadlocks and 
some band t-shirt on and I said, she's going to win this. And she bloody won it. And I campaigned for her like a huge fan of, of that girl. And I went to her first Melbourne gig and I got my CD of her signed. And then I saw her as Mama Cass in Flower Children. And she won two reality yeah. shows. She won I'm a Celebrity as well. But there she is absolutely phenomenal. And this is sort of her first big leading role where she's top billing overall and is australia a heavily catholic country at all or is it a thing, like is there none culture in australia there used to be <laughs> i went to a catholic high school <laughs> that sounded so ominous the way you said it. <laughs> well it's like what happens to all the nuns <laughs> <laughs> yeah you don't really see them as much anymore no like there are sisters but i don't think they're like they don't wear the habit I don't think. There are sisters, but they are not yet doing it for themselves, is what we are saying? No. No, they're they're like at the hospital. They're they're doing it for others. Good. Question for you there, Glenn. Was there anything involved with the process of writing Sister Act the Musical where they were like, oh, that joke is too Catholic. No one's going to get that one. See, I grew up the race Catholic, and then I moved to Chicago in the Midwest, very Catholic. But it's weird being in New York sometimes because, like, there's a very Catholic part of New York, and then there's a lot of New York that does not have a lot of Catholicism in in their past. Yeah, no, you know, everybody working on the show was Jewish. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, so, so we basically had no idea of where the line was on what was offensive or not offensive and you know definitely <laughs> when we opened in new york there were critics who let us know very loudly that we had gone way past them so yes that's catholics literally like the line is so low like there's nothing you can make fun of <laughs> that catholics wouldn't get all huffy about but actually i did have a question that i crossed off but i'm gonna ask it now both you and alan menken keep finding yourselves doing catholic or christian musicals what's with that i know i don't know what i don't really know what's up with that very strange. I'm not sure why, but yes, we keep finding ourselves writing about religious issues and particularly a religion that neither of us are part of. You know, I mean, I think America is a Christian culture and no matter what religion you are, you kind of grow up steeped in all the varieties of it. So it's not like it's that much of a leap that we have to take to to figure it out. But yeah, I mean, we definitely have to sort of put ourselves into a different mindset to access that way of life and that way of seeing the world. And that's what writing is all about. It's about, uh, you know, that act of extreme empathy where you plug into another worldview and recreate it. Yeah. What would you say a song and or a character you feel that really speaks to something that is very Glenn? Something that feels like, oh, this this is something where I feel like I was speaking a lot of as myself as opposed to the character. You know, that's an interesting question. I will say that so much of what I do is based on, uh, obviously it's theater. So it's about not showing myself. It's about becoming a character and speaking in that character's voice and with that character's point of view. And often because working with Alan in particular, who likes to recreate musical styles in his pieces, it's not just picking up the voice of a character, but picking up the voice of a musical genre. So for instance, in Sister Act, it's very much writing in language that is evocative of 70s soul and 70s disco and trying to keep my vocabulary in that in that world. But I would say just in terms of like personality, Gallivant is probably the closest to my actual like natural writing style if I was not trying to evoke a different style. That sort of snarky, sarcastic, jokey voice is probably my own. Certainly the songs that are a little bit more satirical or more in my particular wheelhouse. You know, if I had to pick one song, well, you know, I don't know if I could pick one song. There are so many and I barely remember half of them. So (laughs) I, yeah, I don't even know. I don't even know. Just going to say maybe The Life I Never Let, sung by the amazing Lizzie B currently on the West End. Yeah, you know, I love that song and it's one of my favorites, but very much me speaking in the voice of a novitiate and somebody shy and quiet, which I'm not particularly. So, yeah. But you do write Catholic musicals, which is a life you've never led, (laughs) Glenn. So There you go. Exactly. It doesn't have to be a a confidence thing, but I do want to know what took you all so long to get here. Sorry, Jonathan, you're hosting. I was just saying, uh, like, in New York, it's like, even if you're not growing up Catholic, I think it's it's here. There there are so many different forms of Catholicism. I get four different Catholic churches just on the way to the A train. So (laughs) there are a lot of ways to access it. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I think just in general, so much of American culture is filtered through religion anyway that it's impossible mm-hmm. to avoid it. Yeah. So you just sort of pick up the language and you pick up the ideas fairly early in your life and then they just become part of the culture that, you know, I don't know anybody who's a Mormon, but I know enough about Mormonism or about Scientology or about Hinduism because all of those things exist 
in our world and we can't avoid them. So, yeah, I mean, I think a, there are countries where there's more of a monoculture, where there's like a, not necessarily a state religion, but, you know, like say in England, where everybody is Church of England, more or less, you know, there's a, less of a sense of, oh, I understand what various religions are about. But I think here in New York in particular, it's hard not to just sort of understand what everybody's believing. So much of your work is adaptation and having to be a, a lyrical chameleon to fit so many different sorts of people. How does it change your process to work with different composers, especially composers who approach musical scores as differently as Andrew Lloyd Webber and Alan Menken? Like Webber, who loves establishing a melody and gives you a lot of reprises, and Alan Menken, who you said, like, deal with style, and it feels like a lot of his shows almost unfold as albums do with a lot of variety throughout the entire thing. Yeah. So, you know, Andrew Lloyd Webber is, I like to think of him as an opera composer with some pop savvy, but he thinks in terms of like the full score, like what's the tapestry that he's creating and he's creating Andrew Lloyd Webber operas. So even though they might have some superficial flourishes from other cultures or times or styles, they basically feel like Andrew Lloyd Webber. He writes in long phrases with few notes he doesn't usually write bridges or releases. He likes to sort of do a verse that then, you know, goes up a third and builds and then goes up a fifth and builds. But it's a it's a motivic way of approaching songs that is very composer driven. Alan is basically a pop composer with theater savvy. So the opposite. And Alan thinks in terms of pop songs and particularly style driven pop songs. So if you say to Alan, oh, we're set in the 70s Philadelphia, he'll be like, all right, so that's disco, that's Philly soul, that's early rap. Like he'll go to what are the styles and then what are the sounds and the feels and the melodies that evoke that particular style? And if you said to Alan, well, just write something that sounds like you, he wouldn't know what to do. Or if you said to him, just write something that feels like today, he'd be like, yeah, do I have to? But if you say to him, all right, we're in the Bronx in 1963, it's you know, I'll tuck in the napkin and get out the fork and knife because he is going to dive into that meal with both hands and yeah. just eat. So along the lines of an improviser needing a suggestion, like Alan, he just needs an, a, a genre and an idea to just run with it. Yeah. yeah, you give him that prompt and then he'll sort of create what's the sound world that he wants to be in. And so, you know, something like say, again, we'll, we'll take Sister Act. So with Sister Act, Obviously, the movie used Motown as sort of its language, but what was kind of interesting about it is that it was set in the year that it was made. It was set in 1992, and the Motown songs were the Whoopi Goldberg character sort of singing an oldies club act. And we looked at it and we were like, well, Motown isn't really the language of the time, and it isn't really the language of the character. It's just the songs that she's singing during an act. So what does this musical sound like outside of her act? And yep. we didn't really have an answer. We initially were going to turn down the project for that reason. We just didn't really know how to musicalize it. And we said, well, wait a minute. This is a musical that's about religion for the nuns, but for Dolores, the Whoopi character, that character is all about sex and sensuality and about expressing herself and about living in the moment. And so what's a kind of music that is both quasi-religious and kind of about sex and drugs and being in the moment. And what we came up with was disco. You know, you go to a disco and there's almost a sense of worshiping, right? You're caught up in this kind of mass fervor. You're in a big room. Music is playing. It's about letting go of yourself and feeling the ecstasy. And obviously it's not religious ecstasy, but a lot of the language of that release and of the sense of joy and of the sense of fervor is very similar. And that character would straddle those lines very easily. So once we kind of hit upon that kind of being the key where we could say, all right, we could give her songs that are in the disco tradition about sex and drugs and fun and nightlife and have them shade into being about religion the way in the movie, the Motown songs do that same thing. That was kind of our key in. And then once I said to Alan, all right, our pool is 70s disco. He was like, right. So what are the other pools that we are then tiptoeing into? And then we were in, okay, it's a little bit, you know, late Motown kind of shades into early disco. 70s soul definitely shades into disco. Rap is coming out of that disco tradition as well a little bit with, you know, sampling chic and that kind of stuff. So you give him the kernel of the idea and then he starts creating this sound universe that is both center of the idea and the satellites around it. And then you have enough material to create a full score that feels varied and fun and can accommodate all the different characters and all the different shades of personality. Well, speaking of shades of personality and speaking of the Lord, 
And speaking of musical extravaganzas, I think we can talk about the metal album we have for this episode. Uh, Aaron, do you have anything you wanted to add about Alan Menken? Yeah, I do. I just want to say that religion is, as Bert LeBonte put it, it's what helps people sleep at night, right? So therefore, I don't care what religion someone is and what they're writing or even what sexuality someone is and what they're writing. So I would not in a million years have anybody else write The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. I really wouldn't. Does that score is stunning. Thing. And I would not have, I wouldn't, wouldn't have it any other way. That's all I wanted to say. But yes, metal. Yep, strong fun. agree. <laughs> uh, speaking of safe, you said you've never met a Mormon. Have I got a theater for you? It's called Tuacon. They've done a bunch of your shows out in mm-hmm. Utah. Man, you'd be, a, you'd be a rock star out there. Yeah, I mean, I've heard it's a spectacular venue. And I know that, so speaking of religion, Alan is doing, you know, he wrote an oratorio with Tim Rice about King David, which yep. played for like three days in New York. It was meant to play for three days and then sort of disappeared, but they are bringing it back back I think early next year at Tuacon and he's really excited about that so yet another religion uh, I think got a CD you know what there is a CD yeah I remember it I don't know if it's still in circulation and I don't think it's on Spotify for whatever reason but it did exist I've seen it so it's out there somewhere Spotify for you mm-hmm. anyways move on metal <laughs> yeah so we are running over time now. <laughs> darn Glenn for being so darn interesting. Yes. No, no, it's I, I'll blame you, Jonathan, because you're the host. It is your responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the album this time out was called Fallen Idol by the Australian thrash metal band called Lord, which is a, a sort of a subgroup from another band called Dungeon. And then this was going to be a solo project, but then turned into a whole separate band with yeah. Lord Tim the uh, primary songwriter and frontman of the group. Uh, I had no idea who this group was. I thought for a second we were doing another Lordy album, that Finnish metal album uh, place we had talked to before. But no, this is a whole separate band called Lord. And it was hard to find them on Google. I was very surprised that Royals was not on this album. So yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of Lord-based names and it was kind of hard to find the specific lyrics for this <laughs> <Yes>. one. <laughs> there was Lord, Lordy, and then Lord. And then like I kept going for like Lord Immortal and then it kept going to Christian music. But search engine optimization aside, I have things to talk about on this album. I think this is an incredible example of what thrash can become in the what I like to call the post garage band music era. I think this is a group that has a great idea of what thrash music should be and has a great sense of musicianship and a great sense of the tone most people are looking for when it comes to thrash metal. A lot of times when we get metal albums it's like, hey, but it's metal country hey it's metal mixed with something else it's metal max with rap this one just felt like hey what if metallica in the 80s had written more albums with better microphones great (laughs) this gives me an idea of sort of what that could be the album started off with a huge bang with united welcome back and it's like what's this album going to be it is going to be a thrash album double kick guitars growls screams they do all of the vocals from the 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 cookie monster growls to screams to like the iron maiden operatic stuff and i loved the ambition of this album i would say that one of the problems i would have with this album is that Lord Tim seems to have an excellent idea of what metal is and the songs he wants to create. But when compared to some of the other albums and some of the other artists he's clearly influenced by, the vocal quality of this band does not hit the same heights as like a Rob Halford, Judas Priest, uh, James Hetfield, Metallica, Bruce Dickinson, Iron Maiden. It's just those S tier voices that I sort of like, I wanted that little extra gear because sometimes I think he was trying to push. It's like, yeah, I can do it just like that guy. And it's like, you're getting there, but you're not quite at the level uh, of some of the other ones that I have. Uh, And of course, that's a horrible thing to say. You're not the best person ever in this genre. But if we're looking at this as a critical eye, I feel that that was the thing that kept it from truly breaking out to me. I think that if you're interested in thrash, if you're interested in some butt kicking songs, like I said, United Welcome Back, Chaos Reigning, six and a half minutes of Fury. This album ended so strong. Kill or Be Killed, Master of darkness and i say this in the best possible way these sound a lot like metallica outtakes from the 80s because i love 80s metallica i would say i would definitely listen to this album again if i was film director looking to put something thrashy but not too recognizable in the background of a scene this would be ideal for something like that it's very well done uh but it doesn't draw attention to itself in uh, a way a lot of other metal albums do i would give this one a four out of five and i would listen to it again oh wow i am shocked now before we I know I'm not hosting before we get onto your thoughts, Glenn. We've actually had the bassist Andy Dowling on the show as one of our very early guests. So you're very lucky, Jonathan, because he may end up hearing this. But also because of that, I am at the moment wearing, if I can take my 
My only band shirt I own is a Lord shirt from their Undercovers album. So I thought I better wear it today. But I, I picked this at random, right? Because I thought Lord, it's a religious theme. We can tie that in with Sister Act, obviously, and the musical that we're doing. So I picked it at random. I didn't give any thought to the title of it. I wanted to make sure it was an album that Andy was on. And it wasn't until I'd sent it to you both that I realized, oh, Idol is in the title. Casey Donovan mm. won Australian Idol. So I'm like, wow, it was meant to be. But then I realized the first track was literally Welcome Back and we've given it to Glenn. So welcome back. Last time you <laughs> requested something more thrushier and we weren't totally impressed with the album. So how did you go with this one? Sorry, Jonathan, I'm doing your job. It's okay. <laughs> so I kind of love this album. You know, I agree that like it kicks off right from the beginning and it says this is going to be a thrash album and it hits that note very hard. But what I found interesting about it was that I think that their melodic writing is quite strong. And mm -hmm. unlike a lot of thrash that's very visceral, but kind of can feel samey over time, their melodic writing made each song feel unique and kept each song just kind of locked in and traveling from idea to idea in a way that you could follow and like just feel yourself going from height to height to height because that melody was lifting you up. So for example, something like, uh, well, Immortal, like that's just a, like you hit that chorus and that's just a great melody. And you're like, right, let's get back to that verse where it's all thrashy and then you get to that chorus again. And each time you hit it, you just feel like you're going up a level, up a level until you hit the end. And it's just like, Poof, that was a roller coaster. Take me on that again. Let's hear it for Metal Songs at 6-8. You don't hear that. Yeah, exactly. Likewise, kind of a surprise, Counting Down the Hours, which felt more mm. like almost like an 80s or 90s hair metal power ballad. Not exactly like what the rest of the album feels like, but just getting to that kind of oasis in the middle of all the noise where everything kind of clears out and you just get this moment of soaring beauty and it's beautifully written and beautifully performed. And then you get pulled back down into the thrash and like you're, it's like you've, you know, you've sweated it out, <laughs> your pulse has gone down and then you're ready to get back into the ring. And there you are. You know, I think it's, uh, yeah, the edge of the world coming next, which is just like loud and proud and boom. So I would give this a four out of five also. I would definitely come back to this album i would give it four too believe it or not i actually really love this and whilst i have their t-shirt and have one of their albums on physical cd the covers album i've listened to that one but i've never listened to their other albums because you know wait to do things on this show and I actually disagreed with you, Jonathan, about the vocals. I thought they were actually quite great. And I could hear you sing a lot of these songs as well. And you sing it maybe a little bit better than Tim. No offense to Tim. I'm so sorry. And Andy, please don't hate me for saying that. But He's a much better guitar player than me. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> well, there's that. By the way, your audio is still doing it. Oh, is my audio cutting out again? Yeah. I, I just I, Australia. we don't know what but no one else has does it so I don't it's literally just you and you've got a good mic and I don't know what's happening but but anyways what was I saying yeah so I could hear you do that but I actually heard a lot of different influences all through this but not so strong that they overpowered the band's sound I heard punk I heard maybe flashes of disco here and there. I heard that sort of Lord of the Ringsy Viking type sound. I heard 80s thrash metal. I, I heard sort of a bit of grunge in there. And as I say, it wasn't obvious. I, it sort of felt like it was melted into this album, which again, lyrically, I, I, I do struggle to, to keep up, but it, it did feel like this was a whole album. This was an album from start to finish that didn't have any fillers. It made sense that the track placings made sense. Mm -hmm. Even having Welcome Back at the start. Good boys. Because I had it when like, they'll have Welcome Back and it'll be like the fourth track. And it was like, dudes, it's four tracks in. You put it at the start. Complain about it every time. But yeah, so I, I, I love this. I, I thought this was great. Yeah, I, I enjoyed the fact that the, the lyrics the, at points were just touching and some points like wistful. Absolutely touching and wistful. And then, but also not afraid to go dark. Yeah. You know, Kill or Be Killed is pretty dark. Again, it's that sense of like variety, not just sort of like mono focusing and hammering one idea over and over again, yes. but kind of opening up and dealing with lots of stuff that gives it that feel of being a full album. You feel like you're on a ride. A ride has heights and it has lows and it has like fast turns and it has moments of suspense where you're building. They've got all that in here. You know, you mentioned all the different influences that you could feel. And what I was hearing a lot of melodically, it reminded me a lot of Muse in some ways with those like long melodies and long held notes, big anthemic choruses. 
when you're hitting that many notes and it still all feels coherent and it's from one voice, you're doing something right. And yeah, I think, th I think that they, they kind of nailed it all around. Great album. We loved it. All right. <laughs> Aaron, did you want to ask? Do I have a question? Do I? Yeah. What question was that? What are you, are we on the same script? Rockstar writer? Oh, we meant to do that before the, the metal, but that's all right. I can edit it. That's okay. It's your first time. You're doing really good. Literally on the script. After the metal comes the <laughs> rockstar writer. <laughs> no, it's a segue into it. You meant to improv a segue. We'll move on to the metal. Like, uh, and speaking of aluminium, we're going to move on to the metal now. Something like that. Like, sorry, aluminum. Aluminum. <laughs> God, I wouldn't want people to not understand what I'm saying. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> we asked you this last time, Glenn, and you said the brown M&Ms, but let's see if your answer has gotten more crazier since then. If you could pick your ultimate, craziest, most opulent rock star rider, what are you putting in it? No water? Yeah. Okay. So I think brown M&Ms are the cheap option. So I'm going to scale up now. Yes. I. Uh, Good. We're going with the um, the high-end sushi, I think, and possibly mm. even just my personal sushi chef. Yes. Coming in and doing doing a bit of omakase between sets there. Baller. Very awesome. Baller. Well, let them get away with like candy. Make them pay. Yes. <laughs> and you can have Jonathan in the dressing room next door and he can have his own sumo wrestlers performing. Oh, yeah. That's God. suddenly weird. <laughs> we're bordering on being, being very, very inappropriate right now. I want large <laughs> washi clad men in my room. That's just how I want it. Sorry. That's how that's on the right. <laughs> I have been asking God for that for years, Jonathan, and he will not deliver. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry. It's, all right. Also, I have a YouTube channel based on sumo commentary, so that that didn't come out of nowhere. That's actually a thing. <laughs> Love it. Which is how I discovered Jonathan, and I'm like, I have to have you on my show because you're just as crazy as I am. Anyway, sorry, I'm not hosting. <laughs> I'm shutting out. <laughs> well, it looks like we have a Praise the Lord album. So, Yuka, rest for a minute because we will be idle while we fall into an ad break. Very good. All right. From the producers of Thrash and Treasure, Around the World in 80 Plays, starring the adorable Lizzie B and Alfie Parker, and featuring the star of the show, Dolly the Dog, they'll take you for a trip around the UK, exploring the rich arts and cultural history, but here is a sneak peek. Welcome back to Around the World in 80 Plays. I'm Lizzie B and that... Alfie Parker. <laughs> and we're joined, as always, by the winner of Hot Idol, Dolly the Dog. <laughs> woof, <Yeah>. woof. <laughs> this week, Alfie leapt over to Dublin for the 11th stop of the Sister Act UK and Ireland tour, while I can now be found back in London at the Dominion Theatre for Sister Act the Musical's heavenly return to the West End stage. Because I have actually started rehearsals now. Who would have thought? Very exciting. Oh, well, con congratulations. Thank you very much. Felt like a lifetime away. And then all of a sudden, here I am. But yeah, all good. If this is your first time joining us, we're exploring the UK and Ireland's wonderful arts, history and culture as we make our way from city to city with Sister at the Musical, or at least that's what our producer tells us to say. How's the week been for you, Alfie? Yeah, very nice, thank you. Back in Dublin. Dublin's nice. I always like Dublin. This week's been good. Back at the Bull Gosh. Uh, the theatre is lovely. We'll talk about that later. And yeah, back on the road, kind of getting used to it, getting the swing of it. Flying now and technically international. Whoa. So a bit of a superstar here. You're a bit grown up being on tour without me as well, aren't you? Yeah, you know me. It's kind of just a big grown up, big boy, really. What did you do when I wasn't there to pack your bags? Cry. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> so has anything exciting happened since our last episode? Since our last episode, what's happened? Well, we have Ruth Jones officially on the stage. Now that is exciting. Uh, and Ruth's absolutely smashing it. Uh, she's great. And every show she's kind of adding bits and finding bits and putting her own spin on it, which is great. Uh, so it's lovely to have Ruth there. Um, we're playing traitors at work, uh, which is intense but very fun. I'm still alive for how much longer we'll find out, but I'm still in. 
there's about 500 dressing rooms at the theatre. Uh, so everyone's got their own. That's nice. I won't let you know if I am a traitor or a faithful. You'll have to find out. You can let us know at the end. I'll let you know when it's finished. It'll probably be next week. And we're staying in some lovely apartments uh, by the lock. By the lock? Yeah. 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 By the key. By the lock, by the key, by the water. Just around the corner from the theatre, so that's really nice. But as far as kind of exciting things, I put a Viking helmet on and went round on a uh, splash Viking tour. Went wound, went wound. I went wound and wound on, um, on a Viking splash tour, which is like a bus that goes in the water and converts into a boat. Uh, but very cool. And treasure. I'm Mr. Mr. J Wags. That's Aaron. And we've got to the top of Mount Rock with my friend, the legendary Disney lyricist, Glenn Slater. We're back with Glenn Slater, everyone. I'm risk of putting this idea out into the universe. Uh, if you could see a musical based on a video game, what would that be? And what video game based on a musical would you like to play? Oh, shit. Okay. So if I'm doing a musical based on a video game, I am probably almost certainly doing World of Warcraft. Okay. Wow. Which is, I know it's an oldie, but it's a world that has both big characters, big emotions, and plenty of humor, plenty of comedy. Mm -hmm. And I think that I could knock that one out of the park. I think I could knock that one out of the park. Calling Warcraft an oldie, like Donkey Kong to me is an oldie. Like, well, you know, an, an oldie, I think an oldie for like probably today audiences because it's from right, I don't right. know, 2005 or whatever. But yes, in terms of, I mean, I'm not going to do a musical of like Pong, <laughs> although yeah. I'm sure somebody is, somebody somewhere is working on that as we speak. I feel like Samuel Beckett would have to be like, the, it would have to be the most representational piece ever. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what musical would you play as a game? Yes. Oh, geez. That's a tough one. What musical would I play as a game? Because they released a Grease video game, believe it or not. I believe that. You know, I'm imagining a version of West Side Story where it's like sharks and jets, but it's like a street fighting game. And they're just, you know, ripping each other's heads off and viscera flying and like doing that Jerome Robbins fancy choreography and then, you know, melting into a puddle of guts. I can sort of see that being fun. So could it be characters from other musicals so you could have like McCavity facing off against Bernardo? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm seeing this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, like, riff. And then, you know, hello, Dolly. <laughs> oh, that <laughs> be fun. Be, I'm into this. Super Broadway Smash Brothers. Uh-huh. Holy shit, that is a million-dollar idea of all these iconic... Like, imagine little orphan Annie going against Javert. She would destroy him. Oh, my God, that is so <laughs> exciting. Well, I had... The, for the game that I would like to see as a musical, Life is Strange... That's a very story-based game where you travel back in time and try to solve a mystery or something. I, I got a, a little bit into it, but I never finished it. And the musical that I, I'm so desperate to be made into a game is Little Shop of Horrors, because it could be done as a sort of a, a sim mm. simulation game where you open up a flower shop and then you go uh-huh. and you've got to earn enough money to buy one of the random exotic plants that might spawn somewhere. So it might not be Audrey 2. It could be a different type of killer plant. And you've got to try to keep your shop open and save your customers from being eaten and stuff like that. Like that would be an ongoing game and you can open up different sections of Skid Row. So what about you, Jonathan? Sorry, you're hosting. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, honestly, uh, I've been getting, uh, uh, I have a video game I've been playing called This War of Mine. And it's a very, very depressing video game. My fiance calls it the sad game. Uh, and it's basically <laughs> like, it's, it's like an Eastern European, like Slavic Bosnian type of war, but you do not play as a combatant. You play as a civilian trapped between the two warring factions. And the point of the game is you have to figure out how to survive without fighting. And it's a really interesting game uh, because it provides you with a bunch of like moral quandaries. It's like, hey, there are two adults and one kid in this house. So someone has to stay at home and watch the kid or the kid might get killed. Or if you're going out looking for stuff, like how long can you stay out before you get caught? Uh, how much stuff can you carry or will that slow you down? Maybe you don't go out at all tonight because there's a lot of stuff exploding. And it just becomes a lot about uh, a decision tree. 
I like games that give you a slightly different mental workout than just like Tetris solving the same problem in, in various different ways or uh, like a level based Mario thing. Uh, it has sort of a tree. Uh, and in terms of what musical I'd like to see as a video game, honestly, I think there could be a really fun one for Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> but it mm-hmm. would just be, it would just be like hot murderesses, just like running around figure like murdering for hire. Wow. God, it's just a, a whole area that no one's tapped into except on this show because we're that ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> just back on Sister Act, to you and Alan, can we please, please, please get Sister Act 2 back in the habit, the musical? Because that movie was my jam as a nine-year-old. Oh, my God. I can still quote it today. I've seen it that many times. I have the CD. I have the DVD. I love mm-hmm. it. Yeah, the idea of doing a sequel musical has come up. So I don't know what's going to happen with that, but we will see. We will see. The heavens just opened up and there, there is a God. <laughs> oh, my God. I and mean, we need the songs from the movie plus some extra ones, obviously. But we need the, those are iconic ones because the first one didn't have like, like it had popular songs, but they weren't iconic. If we do get a sister act two, would you be the first lyricist to ever get two sequels? That scares the shit out of me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Having had, uh, you know, a difficult reception to the first one, taking on a second sequel is slightly terrifying, but uh, yeah. Oh, love live or die. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Look, you know what? I know it gets a bit of a bad rap. I think that's not worse. Like we enjoyed ourselves. We saw it live. Mm-hmm. I thought it was well written. Like that old friends song or whatever it is. I'm thinking of merrily real long, but like that mm-hmm. was really catchy. It was just a little bit soap opera. That's all. Yeah, you know what? I I think the music is sensational. Yeah. Um, I think the score sounds great. I think the story needed another it needed an out of town tryout i think <laughs> we needed to to clean up some of it up and needs an australian young writer who is untapped to maybe rewrite it <laughs> Not, yeah. not pointing at anyone. It feels like right now in the current crop of where Broadway is right now, it feels like uh, I have been involved in uh, musicals as both uh, a writer and as uh, and as an actor. Has the process changed? Because I feel like sometimes producers feel that, all right, you've had one out of town, you've had two workshops, and now you must be ready, as opposed to, is the piece ready yet? Does it need a little more time? It feels like this is the time it should take. Is the time, like, is it ready now? Does it feel like it's more assembly line now, or uh, is it more... There's there's still room for artists to try to find their way. Well, I mean, I'm not sure about the assembly line quality of it. And I think that a lot of it is just when is a piece ready? And there are different roads. Not every piece takes the same road. I think there are inexperienced producers who feel like there's a certain road that they have to follow. But none of the shows I've done have followed a particular script of here's the way that it gets to Broadway. They've all been wildly different some of them have been extremely fast some of them have been extremely slow like school of rock for example from our first meeting to opening on broadway was a year and a half and that's like unheard of to go that fast we didn't do any workshops we did one like sort of table read after six months of work where we read through act one basically And then we did, instead of doing an out-of-town tryout, we rented a small theater in New York that seated about 100 people at the Gramercy. And we did like a sort of scaled down version of the show with no sets and no costumes and kind of a random audience came in and reacted the way a a random audience would. And we did that for like two weeks and that was it. And then we went right to Broadway because we all felt like we're not going to learn anything else at this point. Let's just go and do it. You know, in contrast... I've done other shows where we've done multiple out of towns, like Sister Act. We were yeah. out of town in Pasadena in 2006, and then in Atlanta in 2007, and then in London in 2009, and then we didn't get to Broadway till 2011, yeah. I think. And you didn't get to Australia until 2024, Glenn. It took a long time. Oh, goodness gracious me. Uh, and, and it underwent lots of changes along the way. It all depends on where the piece is and where the writers kind of feel it is, and also kind of on the producer how risky are they willing to be? And there are some producers who have worked with artists for a long time and are like, I know you, I know how you work, I know we're going to be fine. And there are some producers who are terrified and want to stick to the, well, here's the tried and true script that other people have done. We're going to do all those steps because I'm worried. So, yeah. You know what, can I just throw in that people are worried because they don't want to get a loss. For some reason now you're seeing it, shows are getting cheaper because producers don't want to be at a loss. Shows are running shorter because they don't want to be at a loss. Shows are being charged even higher for 
less on the stage because they don't want to go at a loss. Don't get into a gambling industry if you don't want to lose. Mm -hmm. Full stop. I think it's ridiculous because you they're trying to manipulate success, but you can't because you're just creating failure after failure after failure after failure, in my opinion. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm actually seeing sort of this like bifurcation going on now where there is large scale commercial theater where it's all about the money and everybody is very cautious mm -hmm. and it's going through long processes, usually with known commodities, either on the writing side or on the acting side where it feels like where we're hedging our bets and then seeing a lot of very small scale musicals starting at like Edinburgh or mm -hmm. starting way, way off Broadway that are risky and taking gambles and they're waiting for audiences to discover them. Uh, before saying, okay, now we can move it to the West End or now we can move yeah. it to New York. And, you know, I mean, they're both legitimate ways of doing it. I would say if you were somebody who was a young writer, like do that small scale show, yeah. take it to a fringe festival, work your ass off on getting it seen, put the songs on TikTok or YouTube or whatever, and like build the audience because that's now a viable path precisely because you're not wasting huge amounts of money. You're being smart about the finances so that when you finally do move to New York, you've got a small cast, cheap to produce, not relying on star quality, not relying on big sets, not relying on buying intellectual property to adapt, mm -hmm. and you can turn a profit. People are charmed by it because it doesn't feel like, oh, I already know the story, or oh, this feels like a product, or oh, this feels like... Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I feel like I'm being manipulated. It's like, huh, I've never heard of this before. I don't know what the hell it is, but I'm willing to take a flyer because I am paying $30 at a fringe festival to see it rather than $200 to see it on the West End. Or I'm paying, you know, a discounted $100 ticket because nobody knows what the hell this is as opposed to, oh, it's a $350 ticket because so-and-so is starring in it. Do you think uh, you are a graduate of BMI, yes? Uh yes. Do you think that I mean, with the, the idea that we're having so many uh, pop songwriters come in to write scores uh, and, and like, and uh, is there a path for uh, just someone to come in, take BMI, learn the craft and then try to get something produced anymore? Or is that just a thing that is sort of in the past? Yeah, no, I think there's definitely a route. I mean, again, I think that there's stepping back. If you look at the shows that are the Tony winning shows for the past 20 years, it's very rarely, let's find a famous movie and get a famous pop star to write it, and there it is. It's the Hades Towns, which was like an obscure folk rock, you know, opera done by a writer nobody had heard of. Avenue Q, Bait Wicked. Yeah, Avenue Q. Your own town? Yeah, know? yeah, your own town. Even The Outsiders, you know, was written by yeah. like two people who were not famous writers and, you know, basically took a, a movie based on a book that everybody knows, but wasn't in and of itself like that kind of, oh, let's fight over who gets to do this musical. It was kind of a weird idea for a musical that they kind of turned into a musical. A strange loop. A strange loop. There you go. I mean, there's so many. I think that it's actually harder now to whip up excitement over the known commodities because- they do feel a little cynical and they do feel a little overdone. And it does feel yeah. a little bit like, oh, it's another movie that they're turning into a musical. Whereas people can get excited over stuffs because they don't know the story going in. And it feels like something that's passion driven rather than money driven. You know, whether you love it or not, you at least are getting a different experience. So happy for stuffs just because of how things have worked out politically for them and that I yeah. hope they had a big yeah. box office surge now. Yeah. But even like, you know, Hamilton was some dude who had had one Broadway show, right? Started as an off-Broadway show, turned to a Broadway show. It was like, well, what am I interested in writing? Had this weird idea of, huh, like the, I just read the biography of Alexander Hamilton and it weirdly echoes the kind of, you know, rags to riches story of rap stars. Maybe there's an idea there. Like that's not an obvious route to Broadway. That's a passion project. And, you know, like there's room for that to happen. If you have that big idea and that way of doing it that feels fresh, why not? And now the tickets are seven hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Six is another good example. Six is a great example. Theater can only become more efficient to a point, and then at, at some point we do need to give living wages to the people who are working on this very inefficient art form. Yeah. And it's just yeah. we we just signed a new uh, off Broadway equity deal, and it's just like labor always keeps going up, and then cost of living always keeps going up. So even if we're charging this, if we're charging the same prices every year, then it's just the money has to come from somewhere else. Yeah. 
But, you know, like Six is a great example. Six starts at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, right? With a cast of six, no sets, one set of costumes, like a small band. They're charging probably 15 pounds a ticket at Edinburgh, which is, you know, for Americans, that's like, what, like $20 at this point, yeah. maybe. And because it costs so much to do, you can scale up as your audience scales up. You can build that audience at Edinburgh. You can come into a theater in London in, in like the East End or the South End where you're not on the West End, but you're charging maybe 30 quid a ticket or 50 quid a ticket and still bringing in young audiences until you can finally move to the West End because you have such a groundswell behind you. And even then you're selling to tourists at full price, but because your costs are so low, you can still afford to do the discounted ticket, the discounted day of ticket, yeah. fill up your theater and you're not losing money. And you've got this enormous groundswell of people behind you who have either already seen the show, have already heard the album, have already heard from somebody who has seen the show that they love it. And you're coming to the West End already a, a certified hit. It's a great model. Even in the age of the internet, isn't word of mouth even more important <laughs> than it has ever been? Yeah. You know, you're not relying on gatekeepers anymore. You're not reliant on sitting down at a piano in front of a room of backers and hoping somebody buys it. You can take it directly to the audiences. You know, you can be those two women who did the uh, Bridgerton musical, just sort of write the songs, put them out there and build an audience and build a property that takes the world by storm. And you, you sidestepped all of those gateposts along the way that can discourage or stop a young writer from doing what they want to do. Aaron, did you want to talk a little bit more about that or did you want to save that for later? Talking about gatekeeping. Yeah, because that's something Jonathan goes on about. That's mm -hmm. sort of your <laughs> activism, if you will. <laughs> yeah, let's let's move on to the, the musical now because my review is quite long. All right. <laughs> Seven pages this week. <laughs> Speaking wow. of rising cost musicals, we're going to talk about rises and leaps, leaping over into the musical now. And this week, Aaron chose a leap of faith, reviewing it this week in front of the lyricist. No pressure, buddy. Hi, Glenn. Thank you for coming on our show. And if you never come back again, I'll do why. <laughs> this will not be the first bad review I've heard of this piece, so I think you're safe. <laughs> I can't well, there is clearly an elephant in the room that we, we can't avoid, but <laughs> we don't want to offend, but we do want to take it seriously. And I also don't want to bullshit people. So this is a very fine line. So let's mm -hmm. let's just let's just have a leap of faith into my review. When I first chose Leap of Faith, it was admittedly with little knowledge of the film and without it being a beloved fan favourite like Groundhog Day, Sister Act, Beetlejuice or even School of Rock, the film hasn't been played on TV every two weeks like the others have been. So I go in blindly, but will I see the light? Or will I have to say 50 Hail Mary Martins for offending our guest? So I gave rise to the Spotify and was instantly taken to church in Whoop Whoop USA with titular leaper Jonas Nightingale selling his snake elixir to the lost sheep. Musically, it's exciting. Lyrically, whimsical and fun, if a little sad. And luckily, this usually lost Aries can follow the scripture. Instantly immersed, my eyes linger on the elephant in the room. Well, my ears linger on the fox in the hen house as we meet Marla, played originally in the film by Liam Neeson. The sheriff has a hunch, and she's onto this con artist. So where was she in 2015? Anyways, for the sly country <laughs> vibe, Jessica Phillips' unique vocals bring character and sass in spades without feeling put on, and certainly without sounding like a bland love interest. Anyways, the charismatic Jonas makes his way into the town's folks' lives as the uncharismatic Aaron makes his way through the album, and I'm able to follow along without being left in the dark. So imagine my surprise when I step into the light and find myself lost oh awkward admittedly the story feels far too familiar which is great for focusing on these fun often banging songs but isn't much of a revelation raul esparza's jonas takes us to the heavens with his rock induced vocals but the story leaves me cold in the clouds but that is solely on the source material which was warmly received in 1992 but has been done numerous times in many different titles. And at the risk of offending our guests, these songs with an original story that has a bit more meat on the bones would have been a better option in terms of audience interest. Not to bring up that fox in the hen house, because Menken's score and Slater's lyrics are fun, lively, and on brand to both artists. 
Anyways, four stars for the music. It loses a point for plot and would have been nice to end on a fun, lively number as opposed to the uplifting gospel finale, which doesn't raise the roof until the very final 20 seconds. After such a catchy, boppy time, I wanted to be revived and left crucified. This is a really good score. I don't know what happened when it was on Broadway. That was obviously... Well, so it's it's interesting because so obviously this was a flop. This show opened on Broadway and closed two weeks later and did not receive kind reviews and is sort of, you know, like shorthand for, you know, if you go onto any bulletin board nowadays, like shorthand for worst musical I ever saw. And nobody sets out to write a flop, obviously, and nobody sets out to produce a flop. So the question is always, well, what happened? And this is a show where while we were in it, it was hard to tell what was happening, but being out of it, it's pretty obvious what happened. You mentioned that the source material let it down. And so the first mistake that happened with the show was that we didn't quite follow the source material. No, The original film, the Steve Martin character, the Jonas Nightingale main character, is not the romantic lead. He's a dark character who stays dark. The romance is between Deborah Winger, who is his sort of sidekick, and the sheriff, who is male. There's a lot more going on that's more cynical and dark. It's more about the manipulation going on and less about the emotions. And I think the way that the film was received warmly was because it was a little bit darker about the way religion works in America. But only warmly, only warmly. It wasn't a massive success. It got 65% on Rotten Tomatoes, so it was only warm response compared to other comedies of that era sister act yeah massive success had a sequel a year and a half later yeah well it wasn't a, really a comedy it was considered like more of a character study oh, and it was okay. sort of surprising for people because it was steve martin's first non-comedic role and they were expecting it to be a comedy and it, it really wasn't at all it was again yeah. just sort it was of sold as a comedy i remember that movie coming yeah. out it was sold very much as like steve martin's music man comedy and it's like oh this is very different yeah Now, I was not the first lyricist on this project. There was a lyricist before me. And so before I came on the project, two things happened. The first was that the producers got in touch with Hugh Jackman and convinced Hugh Jackman that this was going to be this role of a lifetime where he could interact with the audience and be a showman. And he said, great, Alan Macon's writing the music. I'm on board. And then the decision was made, well, then we need to change the character. He can't be this dark guy who ends the film alone and kind of castigated and left out of the happy ending and leaps slunking out of town on a bus. We need to make him the romantic lead who gets the girl and is part of the happy ending. And that's where the show went off the rails. Because this is a character who is a bad guy. He is a bad person. He takes money from people who need it. He blasphemes. He is anti-religious. He is not kind to the people who work for him. He's just a nasty piece of work. And in order to turn him into the person who you want to end up getting the girl and becoming the father figure to the kid at the end... You have to do a lot of plot work to make that happen. And for a property that we were all attracted to initially because of the darkness and because of the questions it asked about religion playing a cynical role in American life, we very quickly realized that we were, well, we didn't really quickly realize, we didn't realize until it opened, but we found ourselves writing a show that turned out to be a basic Christian redemption tale about bad guy doesn't believe in religion, then something happens which may or may not be a miracle and it changes his life and he becomes good. And that's really not what we set out to write in the first place. Wow. So in the process, which was one of those basic processes where you're doing a workshop and then an out of town and then another workshop and then another workshop, this show went, it was good, it was bad, it was good, it was bad. Timing just seemed to work out so that we did our out of town in Los Angeles And during that out of town, the sheriff was still a man and the love interest was not a sheriff. She was a waitress, like in the movie. Brooke Shields. It was Brooke Shields. And the plot didn't quite work and we did not get great reviews. And so we took a big roll of the dice and shuffled a lot of things and cut a lot of subplots. And in the process, took a show that wasn't great and made it worse and lost some of the songs that were really working. And we thought we still had another year to work on it. But unfortunately, our producers secured a theater. We had a phone conversation with them in January where we said, we need another year to figure this out because it's still not there. And they called us two weeks later and said, so we're starting rehearsals in three weeks. (laughs) (laughs) 
And so we went into rehearsals having a show that wasn't quite ready to be produced yet. Okay. Yeah. And so what ended up on stage was kind of a car crash. And, you know, we had a fantastic cast that gave it their all. And we kind of let them down in the in the writing and producing department, I think. You didn't let them down. And I apologize <laughs> to the movie for blaming you in my review. <laughs> it's Hugh Jackman's fault. It's all his fault. That's who we blame. <laughs> because it's, again, it's that movie star thing. And I, I was talking, and this is completely off topic, but I was talking to someone about sort of nudity in films the other day that you'll never see a hero's penis because it will devalue the hero. It'll devalue that actor for some reason, right? It's the mm-hmm. same thing with putting an actor like Hugh Jackman in a villainous role. They're too afraid to take that risk because they don't want to devalue his heroism. It's absolute nonsense that he's an actor. Yeah. Good on you, Hugh Jackman. It was not his fault that he fell out of the project. We had scheduled a six-week workshop that he was all in for, and he you know, was with us in auditions, auditioning the woman who would play opposite him and all that sort of stuff. And then the shooting schedule for, it was either the first Wolverine movie or for Logan, uh, changed. And he was going to be shooting that, unfortunately, while we were doing the workshop. And so the producers were like, oh, well, we can't change the workshop. Like, what are we going to do? And they had just produced Company that Raul Esparza had starred in. And so they said, well, Raul is our buddy. We'll we'll bring him in. So Raul came in and Raul was amazing in the workshop. And and the producers stopped and they said, well, huh, we could go back to having Hugh Jackman in the role and we'd have to pay him probably a million dollars a week mm-hmm. and <laughs> probably not make a profit. Or we could have Raul Esparza, who is also fantastic and is not nobody and would cost us a tenth of that. And they decided to stay with Raul Esparza. Again, amazing actor, one of the most uh, intelligent thoughtful actors you could ever have and brought so much to the role. And again, I could not ask for somebody to just sort of like just dive in heart and soul and deliver everything to the role. But Raul's definitely like a dark personality. And ultimately, I think the darkness of just who he is as a performer didn't necessarily mesh as well as it could have with what that role was asking for, which was somebody who is very light yeah. That slowly turns dark with Raul, you kind of get the darkness from the beginning. We didn't necessarily take advantage of everything that Raul can do in the writing to make it work with him as opposed to Hugh Jackman, if that makes sense. You think there's any appetite for a city center revival of Leap of Faith in five years with a new grittier book? You know, honestly, I don't know. And I think that uh, Alan and I were actually talking about this the other day. Not that anybody is asking for this, and I don't think it will ever happen. But I think if we were to go back to it, what we would probably probably go back to is a version of what we did in California. Mm -hmm. We cut some songs that were good and we put in into those slots what we were thinking of as placeholder songs for a workshop, knowing Mm -hmm. that we didn't have a script ready yet. We were just kind of writing songs that would kind of do what we thought they would do. And because of the way the schedule worked, that ended up being what we had and they weren't as good as what we had. So we would probably go back to some earlier version and try to make that earlier version work. Watermill. Yeah, possibly. But again, I don't think this is something anybody is asking for. So <laughs> I think it will be a long time before that ever happens. Yeah. Just for listeners, I'd say Watermill because there's a theatre company in the UK based out of Watermill and they do a lot of sort of immersive productions. They've just done The Lord of the Rings, which was another bomb. Like it it was a, an expensive failure and it got terrible reviews. They've turned it into a hit, right? And they turned it into sort of this immersive thing where you start outside and you go inside into the theater, they could do it and turn this into a hit because that Lord of the Rings is now playing in Chicago and it's about to open in New Zealand. Mm-hmm. So give it to them. Like, well, Watermill, if you're listening, get Leap of Faith because there are some really good songs in this show. I think the score is great. Like, even the ballads aren't a dull moment and I can follow along what's going on. As I say, it was just the story was generic, which I blame the source material, but apparently it was yeah. not. Yeah, we genericized it. (laughs) We made it more generic than it needed to be. That was Hugh Jackman's fault. We're going to blame him because he's not here to defend himself. (laughs) So much about revival culture that lends itself to musical theater. It's like uh, I was fortunate enough to get a a copy of the the Broadway script while I was going through the the thing. And just going through, like, first of all, how fast the songs come in the show. Like, they they really come Mm -hmm. so back to back to back. And they're connected. Like, the, the book scenes are so tight. I was a little surprised that the show was meta. The show takes place in the St. James and we're telling the story of how it goes back. 
And it was one of those ones where it's like, I really wish I could have seen this because the music makes so much of it come alive. And I think the show really sings, no pun intended, uh, and the revival moments. The show absolutely takes off in these moments is on the recording. You have some really stunning triple rams in the show, Glenn. Just <laughs> like, thank you. Brands, brands, <laughs> chance. That's a great one to get in there. There was uh, especially uh, what's really hard to do is simplicity without coming across cliched or that the characters are somehow less intelligent. And there are some really beautiful moments in the show where I thought, uh, like, and I can read you when it goes from like the verse into those like B sections where they're being honest with each other. Like Marla's section was just utterly perfect. Like it just it it melted me the way that the vernacular came out of that and so naturally. Thank you. You know, one of the things that was most fun for me was taking the structure of, of a revival meeting and the way gospel songs work and figuring mm -hmm. out how to make the songs work as standalone gospel songs that you could take out of context and they would work, but have them still tell story mm -hmm. and not just tell the story of what's happening in the revival, but we usually in most of those scenes had a, well, there's something happening on stage during the revival. That's the actual show they're putting on. And then also a subtext of what's happening with the characters behind the scenes or how they're working their scam or what the emotional valences are and how they're changing. And so making all those work together in, in one like sort of long sequence that just kind of takes you from gospel moment to gospel moment, builds the way a revival would, and then is still carrying you through character moments and plot moments. I will say, you know, most musicals that work have some kind of I'm going to call it a special effect. It doesn't need to be like a chandelier that falls, but some sort of thing that is unique to that show that is the memorable thing from that show. A helicopter. Yeah, yeah. Or it could be anything. I mean, it could be, you know, a choreography style, or it could be a costuming decision, or it could be, you know, whatever, whatever it is. We, while we were doing the show, we thought that our special effect was going to be that gospel choir. Because whenever we did a workshop of the show, you know, we'd be in a rehearsal room and we'd bring in... 100 or 200 people to see this workshop and they'd be sitting there two feet from a 12 person choir and it was like sitting in front of a blast furnace you know this <laughs> wall of sound would come out of them and your hair would like blow back like in one of those memorex ads or something and we said like holy crap like audiences are just going to be blown away just by the sheer like volume and the voices hitting them in that way and then we got into a theater and the audience wasn't sitting three feet away. The audience was sitting quite far in many instances. And St. James, that's a huge. <laughs> yeah. And in LA, we were in the Amundsen, which is a, a, you know, a vast barn. And suddenly that 12 person choir wasn't this like force of nature hammering you into submission. It was a small clump of people on a very large stage, very far <laughs> away from you. And it did not have the intended effect that we thought it would have at all. And we never really were able to sort of recover from that. You know, I mean, it, 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 we had planned a whole show around getting a certain value out of that gospel choir that it never actually delivered. And again, this is not, this is not about the performances, which were amazing. Mm -hmm. It was just about the scale, the scale. Uh, Aaron, did you want to ask about uh, writing charismatic characters? Yeah, does writing for charismatic characters like Jonas and even Dolores Van Cartier from Sister Act create any different challenges as opposed to writing for a sort of karma, maybe even more generic straight man character? Or is that wordplay more freeing because you get to sort of play around a bit? Yeah, I mean, I love writing for charismatic characters. Another one would be uh, Flynn Rider and Rapunzel has that same sort of trickster energy to them. And, you know, they're so much fun to write for because they, first of all, yes, you get to write comedy because they're always sort of changing up their approaches. You get to write in lots of different styles for them. You get to write both text and subtext because what they say and what they mean is not necessarily ever the same thing. And so you get to play around with those different levels. But perhaps best of all is that when those characters actually let down their guard, you get your best emotional moments because you know you get so used to them being insincere or being sly or being mm -hmm. sarcastic. And you have so much fun writing them in that way that when that moment comes that they're not, and they're just sort of stunned into speaking from the heart, you get to write those simple, basic, honest songs that are meaningful and hit twice as hard because you know they're coming from a place where the character doesn't usually come from. And those melodies written by an Alan Macon or an Andrew Lloyd Webber who write such beautiful, simple melodies that really land melodically is such a gift because 
I can write the comedy stuff and the sarcastic stuff all day long, but it's hard to write something simple until you know how it's going to sound when it's sung. And getting those melodies from guys like that and being able to say like, all right, <laughs> here's this like perfect gem of a melody. And all I have to do is put the simple words on top of it. I don't have to be tricky. I don't have to be poetic. I don't have to do anything but find a very simple way to say something fresh and honest. And it will hit triple power because of the simplicity of the melody and because of the context of that character. It's a, it's a gift. Love doing that. Yeah. Speaking of beautiful simplicity, it's time for an ad break. All right. That? No, that was not. That's not what was in the <laughs> script, J Wags. You gotta say it. Oh, say it. No. Don't pet. I'm segueing. We loved it. <laughs> G'day listeners, Aaron here. Normally I would be joined by Spencer, so I guess we'll pretend he's here. Oh, hey Aaron. And it's time for this week's update of the Bloop Network news. There's nothing much going on really. Lizzie and Alfie are still performing in Sister Act, both on tour and on the West End. So if you're in the UK, grab tickets to that. Jonathan's show at Second City NYC is still running every second, I believe, Monday, where they'll have a special guest come on and tell a story, and then the cast have to then improvise a performance based on the story that the extra special guest told. Also, on the Bloop Network, we have And the EGOT Goes To. Now, we're actually currently looking for a panel for the Emmys portion of the series. So if you are a huge television fan, let us know on Twitter at EGOT underscore podcast or email us at networkbloop at gmail.com. That's networkbloop at gmail.com and let us know that you're interested in auditioning for the panel for And the EGOT Goes To, which recently had its first ever live episode recording and that is currently on our Patreon as an exclusive and will be released to the public next week. Also, if you have an idea for a podcast that's been bubbling away in your mind, you can always pitch the idea to us at networkbloop at gmail.com. Put in as much detail as you can, whatever you've got planned out. But if you have a show idea that's about movies or television, politics, sports, life in general, we are looking for unique concepts that you're not going to find anywhere else. So hit us up at networkbloop at gmail.com with your pitch. And who knows, maybe this time next year, you'll be sitting here recording one of these ads, just like me. But anyways, back to the episode. We're back with Thresh Treasure. I'm Mr. J Wags. That's Aaron, the village idiot, as he likes to be called. Say hi, Aaron. Hi, Aaron. <laughs> and we are reuniting with the lyricist who is dearest to our hearts, Glenn Slater. So, Glenn, what is one thing you fail at miserably that everyone else seems to do perfectly well? Huh. Okay. Interesting question. So I'm basically like a brain in a jar. And so very simple things like dancing or gymnastics. If, like if you ask me to do a simple forward roll, yeah, I cannot do that. If you ask me to do like a very simple line dance, days will go by before I do it correctly. I have absolutely no ability to follow very simple physical instructions. Yet I see a piano behind you, which means I'm assuming you have some enough piano skill to be able to have limb interdependence to do that. I have some piano skills, not okay. very good ones, but I have some piano skills. I do happen to be married to a composer yep. and she has fantastic piano skills. She's a um, like a full-fledged jazz piano expert as well as a composer. So the piano is mostly for her to impress me with, which she does on a nightly basis. Well, to jump on that, uh, I am also uh, working on a musical with my life partner and writing partner at the same time. So uh, if you could throw me any advice you have with the best practices you have found with working with your life partner for both results and happiness. As in how, how does his partner not strangle him at the end of the day, basically, is what he's asking. Moulin Rouge like all of Writing songs with your partner is <laughs> the most passive aggressive thing we do. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, 
It's um, tricky to collaborate with a life partner because when you're collaborating with somebody who is not your actual spouse or partner, you can yell at them. You can be angry. You can fight. And obviously, if you do that with somebody who you're, you know, who is your life partner, you risk having your artistic disagreements spill over into actual life. And so honestly, I think that the the way to deal with it is to remember that you're both on the same side, that you both want to create something great, that neither of you is right or wrong, and that any piece is going to go through a million different versions and revisions and changes. And it's not that important to be right right now. <laughs> you know, you can you can be generous and let the other person have their vision. And if you are wrong and they are right, then you can praise them to the skies for being right and proving you wrong. And if they are not right, it is very easy to very gracefully move on to the next idea, the next time, the next iteration of the piece. But like, don't fall into that trap of thinking that getting the piece of art right is more important than the relationship right. because it's ultimately not. And, yeah. you know, you can be right and alone, which is not <laughs> what you want to be. <laughs> we can't all be Meredith Wilson and do it all ourselves. Book, music, and lead. Yeah, I will also say that and this goes for any collaboration, but all art that is collaborative thrives on constant conversation and constant thrashing out the ideas and not necessarily arguing, but disagreeing and finding agreement and finding what you don't like and finding what you do like and talking it through and talking it through. If you do that with a life partner, you're having those conversations all the time. So that yeah. when you finally get into a rehearsal room, you are a united front because you've already had all your disagreements. You've already thrashed everything out. I did a, a show with my wife called Beatsville. That was a mm -hmm. sort of a bebop jazz musical. She wrote the music and the lyrics. I just did the book. And yeah, you know, we absolutely had a lot of like disagreements about this plot point or that plot point or should the song work that this way or that way or, you know, is the character this or that. But by the time we finally got to the point where we were doing a production, we knew what each other other was thinking so well that we could literally like finish each other's sentences and head off any disagreements at the past. And we went into production, did our first few previews, realized that the end of the show wasn't working. And we rewrote literally the last 40 minutes of the show over like a day off. We had a day off. She wrote three new songs. I rewrote the entire script. Everything changed. And we were able to do that because we were practically telepathic at that point. And we had talked about everything so much. So if you can write with a spouse, I would absolutely recommend doing it and get through those disagreements with grace in the early period so that you get to that moment later where you are an unstoppable force of total agreement. In your mind, and like, this is a huge question, but if you if, and if you just want to skip it, Ken, uh, what in uh, your mind makes a, a good lyric as opposed to a bad lyric, metaphysically speaking? So I think there are a couple of components. The first thing is that it needs to be true to the character and true to the character's voice. Meaning whatever they sing has to be something that that character would plausibly do or say in the moment. And in terms of the actual words need to come right out of how they would talk in prose so that there's a seamless shift from the book into the lyric. You know, any musical sits on this sort of weird line between the sublime and the ridiculous, right? It's like, you know, a person's talking and then suddenly they're singing. It's absurd. And if you make a misstep, you fall off that tightrope into this is the most ridiculous thing. I don't believe a word of this. I'm not buying it. I'm off the boat, right? So it's very crucial to make sure that you're using the same language, the same vocal tics, the same vocabulary, the same slang that the character is using in the book as you move into song so that that transition feels smooth, so that the viewer isn't jolted into realizing, oh, they're about to sing, this is stupid. And it's just kind of going, oh no, they're just kind of heightening from speech into something that's not quite speech into something song. So that's very key. I would say that it's very important to maintain a strong sense of structure so that the listener always knows where they are in the song. A song needs to feel like a three-act play where there's something always happening, where you're moving to a new idea, and so that you start the song in one place and you end the song in another place. Because otherwise, it's three minutes or four minutes of an audience sitting there listening to somebody sing for no reason, right? If the if the character begins and ends in the same place, then it's just masturbation for, to be writing something beautiful for the audience to just sit and zone out and then they come back and now the story is going to continue. 
And you need to structure your song so that that movement is happening on a verse to chorus level, on a line to line level, on an idea to idea level. And so highly structured so that the audience can follow. Here's where we are in the plot. Here's where we are in the idea. I can see where they're going. I can see where it's moving. And now here we are, we're in this new place. And now I'm ready for the plot to take off in this new direction. And then the third element, I would say, surprise. You want to constantly try to surprise the ear, whether that's an image that the audience isn't expecting or a rhyme that feels like it's out of left field or an idea that is a new idea that hasn't occurred to them. But you want to provide those little bits that catch the ear and that sort of make an audience perk up and realize, oh, I have to listen carefully. Um, Because again, you can lull them into this state of, well, that all feels familiar, that all feels familiar, and then you lose them. It doesn't need to be a huge surprise. I mean, look, obviously like a big fancy trick rhyme is going to be surprising and that's great, but it can just be a triple rhyme when you're not expecting a triple rhyme, or it can be a very simple rhyme. It could be a a love glove, obvious rhyme. If glove is stated in a way that you're not expecting, right? It can be just an image, you know, in Leap of Faith. One of the things I'm most proud of in the chorus of the song Leap of Faith It's kiss your fears goodbye and step into the sky. And that image of stepping into the sky, of taking a leap of faith, it's just a fresh way of using that. I mean, leap of faith is a cliche, but to think of it as stepping into the sky makes it feel new. It's an image that you wouldn't think of, and it makes you think of it in a different way. And it gives it a sort of a Zen transcendental, you know, you're not jumping, you're just kind of taking a step into the unknown, not knowing where it's going. Just that little bit of a surprise idea can lift the entire song up and keep the audience with you. So I think those are the main components. That was probably much more of a detailed answer than you were expecting. I love that. I'm, I'm such a process geek and just I've written exactly enough songs to know how hard lyrics are. They're, they're so hard to do well. Uh, I'm sorry, Aaron, but Aaron, uh, I know you wanted to talk a bit more about Sister Act before we, we got out of here. Yeah. Although, uh, what he was meant to say, Glenn, was, well, if one thing can be certain, blessed is he who comes in the name of an ad break. That sounded less dirty in my head. <laughs> he wussed out of that, would you believe? <laughs> Anyways, that, this UK, I'm horrible. This UK revival production, which is opening in Australia when this episode drops, has been a phenomenal success. And I can't help but wonder how much of that is all because you've cast the superstar Lizzie B. You know, Lizzie is fantastic. And we've actually, that role over the years, we've had a lot of like pretty major stars. When we opened on Broadway, it was Marlon Mindell, who has since written and starred in Titanic, which I think is also coming to Australia soon, Yep, which is this amazingly hilarious parody of Titanic using the Celine Dion catalog. Lizzie B, obviously very different performer with a very different style, but just, I mean, that voice and that presence is She's amazing and brings so much to the role. So yeah, I mean, we're really lucky. And, uh, you know, I, I can't wait to see who's stepping into the role in Australia. Um, I did look it up. But look, I, I work with Lizzie and her partner, Alfie, who is also mm-hmm. in Sister yeah. Touring as yeah. as Eddie Souther. I produced their podcast, which I created on my message to them and said, hey, you guys ever thought about doing a podcast? Because I could see there's like there's a certain charisma between the two of them that they're just really charming and they've got a certain something when they're together. Uh, and mm-hmm. they thought about it and they said, yeah, let's do it. And so the show is about them touring in sister act so i have been promoting your show for you you're welcome glenn thank you (laughs) and they are not only just incredibly professional and incredibly talented and and charming as i say Alfie, he could make millions doing audiobooks for one thing. Lizzie is just as sassful and i love her so much but they are just beautiful people and I, i i'm so thrilled to be working with them and you also you cast jonathan so thank you for casting my friends yeah i mean how how smart was that and by the way i'm not surprised that he's like ad living all over your script because that's what you did in dewey as dewey in school of rock just bringing that like freestyle energy is so important to that role yeah so oh man like that was times 10 the hardest thing i've ever had to do <laughs> was oh, doing yeah. dewey then but you were brilliant well thank you it's, it's so it, it, really rare for a person of this body to be told oh no everything you are is exactly what we are looking for that almost Mm -hmm. never happens yeah well you know and it's it's such a hard role because you're basically in every scene and you're singing at like full force endlessly and Mm -hmm. yet you also have to kind of be like sort of 
alert enough and aware enough to be doing those ad libs and to be working off the kids and to kind of be in the moment and not just kind of working through the script. So to have that kind of both the like the fortitude and the agility at the same time is that's a that's an unusual combination. And it's also the one weird thing that I didn't really get until like midway through the callback because they kept having me do the bedroom scene. And it's just like, oh, everyone needs to be very comfortable with this grown man in a bedroom with children every show. <laughs> <laughs> and it just and like just being one of those things like oh i bet you could find a lot of grungy guitar guys who are funny but it's that sweet spot that you got really got to hit with that role the kids can never yeah. even be in implied danger uh it's like uh i do love roles where you feel sort of like a ringmaster and you get to sort of move the show it, it was always fascinating to me like how fast or slow the show moved depending on the dewey like mm -hmm. that show could run 220 or 235 depending on which dewey we had in on any given night absolutely absolutely very fortunate to do first regional out there and it was it was an utter utter blast giant canyon with all these fireworks and just like and one night we had a storm gathering during the show i literally looked at the audience and said the kid said we've got it what the school of rock thunderclap the school of rock. <laughs> oh, wow. and it's like god Amazing. mormon god came down and said this is the show and like Amazing. an actual thunderclap happened at that moment <laughs> that, was, that was a lot of fun. Uh, and yeah, I feel like we like we've talked about ninety times more in this one conversation than we ever had because we were in very different rooms when School yeah, of Rock was exactly. <laughs> I said it's lovely like to actually have a conversation because I feel like we we were introduced twice and then it was like he had to go off and work on things and I had to go off in a room and like work on things and yeah we yeah he was the superstar and you were the understudy. I was the guy that yanked out of the rough theater. Yeah, <laughs> it's not so much that it's that they also don't like the lyricists talking to the actors because either I'm undermining the director director or I'm undermining the composer every time I open my mouth. Oh. So it's like, introduce yourself and then just fuck off until we need you to say something. God, this industry is <laughs> weird. Oh yeah. Some interesting moments on that show. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I have a question, Glenn, because Sister Act, she's not really a nun. Leap of Faith, he's not really a priest or a preacher. Love Never Dies, it's the Phantom Undercover. The Little Mermaid, she's not really human. And School of Rock, he's not really a teacher. What's up with that? <laughs> yeah, Glenn. Yeah, I, I don't know what's wrong with me. <laughs> this is something I'm going to bring up with my therapist, I think. Why? Am I a fraud? <laughs> villains get the best songs. Isn't it more fun to write the villain songs? <laughs> it's so much fun to write the villain songs. Look, yes. it's fun to write villains. It's fun to write tricksters. It's fun mm -hmm. to write where the text and the subtext are wildly different. Yeah. So I don't know. I It just keeps coming out that way. Who knows why? Yeah. But I, but I, I'm not complaining. To dive back into something we were talking to a little bit more about, uh, the idea of gatekeeping and that like art has become yes. very small and democratic. I see both sides of this equation and that I think that in a way it has become too easy to make and consume art in a way mm -hmm. that we never had to worry about before. So in a way, a lot of art has become, and I mean this like worthless and that it has no monetary worth because it's almost free. Yeah. But also coming from a side where it's like living in New York and dealing with Broadway, where literally there are 90,000 ways to know before you can even get your first audience for anything. Like I said, working on a new musical right now, just like there's so many paths to know. What is the correct level of gatekeeping that do you think uh, that will reward the artists who are really dedicated, trying to get their craft out there? How much gatekeeping is too much to make sure that society, that we're not getting everything out all at once? So it's tricky because again there's sort of like two levels here there's the musical writing that's happening on the level of the already known performers where the gatekeeping that's going on is basically well which known writers do i want on this project more or less and then there's the gatekeeping of that great group of people who are still trying to break through where there's no gatekeeping because nobody knows who they are and nobody wants to hear from them. They're not being invited to work on Beetlejuice or they're not being invited to work on, you know, whatever the movie of the moment is because those projects are going to the people who already have names. And, you know, I think that we're actually at an interesting moment of gatekeeping where we're, we're at a sort of a generational shift where the big names are kind of now aging out a little bit. And, you know, I'm like a Gen X writer and there's a handful of us who are writing, but we're not necessarily that interested in doing the, turning the movie into the musical thing. And after us, there's not really name writers anymore. So producers are turning to people who are less names and more kind of hot prospects. 
people who have done like a cabaret show that has caught their eye and so they get a chance to do something or have a novel. done something <laughs> or three novels well yeah i mean you know but you look at like shana taub who had done a bunch of stuff that was under the radar and then got pulled yeah. up to do uh the devil wears prada and then her own show or you know julia madison who is doing the death becomes her which is opening on broadway in the fall but like prior to that had done like some cabaret stuff you know just sort of been in the world and seen some stuff and the gatekeepers are now turning to that sort of arena where it's not so much have you done something but are you like have you shown that you have the chops more or less and i think that's a good level of gatekeeping where there are people who are actively looking for new voices and who kind of know what those new voices should sound like and can sort of determine all right well you haven't done a big broadway show but you've got this skill that skill and another skill so you could do a broadway show let's give you a shot and see how it goes and you know sometimes it works out sometimes it doesn't but that's a good position to be in you know if you are an up and coming writer the trick is still to do all that legwork you can't not do it it's always been that way i mean you know Sondheim was going to backers auditions and performing in nightclubs everybody has done it the version of doing that now is TikTok and YouTube and still nightclubs and that kind of thing. So you still have to do it all. But the more you're out there, the more you get seen. There are a lot of projects going on and a lot of producers, a lot of young producers now, because again, the boomer generation is starting to fade away. Those younger producers want to produce people their age and they want to produce musicals that sound like the music they want to hear and the musicals that they grew up loving. And so there are opportunities out there and there's going to be more of them. And the barrier to entry is not, you know, you're not going into a room with like some guy who actually produced on time and trying to impress him that guy is no longer producing and it's his nephew is producing and his nephew or son or grandson has different taste and is ready for that to be the new normal on broadway we often have this discussion between aaron and i about uh the idea of older musicals being rewritten but aaron why don't you take take this one <laughs> well we see a lot of older musicals being rewritten and updated after the original creatives have passed on but i personally feel that if the creatives are alive and want to revisit something by all means mm -hmm. go ahead if you aren't happy with what well, look at what happened with merrily we roll along it, it got rewritten and, and fixed by sondheim not by somebody else what's your stance on this like in 70 years if someone comes along and rewrites the lyrics to sister act just to suit what they want from the production mm -hmm. are you going to haunt the fuck out of them i Yes, good. I will. Good. <laughs> Thank you. There are shows that get rewritten because they're close to working and don't quite. So like Susical or uh, The Addams Family, which didn't quite work on Broadway and weren't successful on Broadway. And the creators kind of said, yeah, but we know why. And so let's change a couple of songs. Let's change the book. Yeah. And both of those shows that I just named have gone on to become sort of like Very perennials in yeah. this stock and amateur field and, and regional productions and touring, you know, done everywhere all the time. Adam's Family is the number one high school musical. Yeah, because their creators realized we were close and we know how to solve it. There are shows like Leap of Faith, let's say, that will that the creators don't go back to because honestly, we spent eight years writing that thing. It doesn't work. And the idea of like, the idea of going back to it is just exhausting. Like we don't want to go back to it. It didn't work. Give it to me and Jonathan. Me and Jonathan will do it. Fine. Well, <laughs> we're ready to move on. Let's move on to the next thing and no yeah. longer speak of this, you know, this, this thing that didn't work. There are shows like, well, Sister Act is actually a good example where I love it. It still works, but there are definitely some lines and some themes and some bits that are maybe in a post-pandemic Gen Z world are skirting the line, not quite being kosher. And yeah, I mean, we've definitely talked about, do we go back in and fix some of that stuff? And does this song still have a place in 2024? Does this idea still have a place in 2024? So there's a world where you sort of clean stuff up just so that it can continue to be produced while still basically being the thing you wrote. Yeah. Um, and you don't love doing that, but you also kind of realize that at some point you might have to do that. And it's you doing it though. It's not someone else. If you're doing it, it's... Yeah. Exactly. The idea of when I'm dead, somebody doing it, you know, honestly, like I'll be dead and they'll do what they want, but my children <laughs> will be told, do not let them do this. <laughs> it's like Rent. Rent is scrappy, but it's locked in time because we don't touch it don't touch it ever like even if something is offensive you're not okay when i look at something that's outdated and offensive in 2024 
I'm not looking at it as if it was written in 2024 or a comment on 2024. It's a comment on 1972, but it might be mm -hmm. set in 1952. Uh -huh. So it's using that vice, the vice of the 50s, to tell a story or a comment on 1972. So I look at it through a 1972 lens, and I don't know why the village idiot is the only one who does that, because everyone seems to get bloody offended by everything. That's something you can always count as a given in people. You can't always count context and satire. People don't always get that. And also... I know. Some things are like, I mean, look at Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. They have changed so much of that because I don't think anyone wants to have to explain to a four-year-old about colonialism and about like, hey, <laughs> we can fat shame people in this book, but we shouldn't do it in life. I think the kid just want to tell a whimsical story, and I don't think that removing the horrible colonial racism from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory removes the idea of that being a wonderful <laughs> show, and it does, in fact, allow it to keep on moving. Look at Disney. I mean, Disney is famous for taking incredibly dark stories and turning them into Disney entertainment, which all the families can enjoy. Look at Hunchback. Look at Hercules. I mean, on the page, Disney shouldn't be touching these ones, but they mm -hmm. have, and I think very artistically successfully. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but once someone's dead, just leave it alone. Like, Camelot. Look what they did to Camelot. Aaron Sorkin is a genius, and he's an incredible writer, but that wasn't his art. Mm -hmm. you know, we're not going to the Mona Lisa and painting eyebrows on her because she should have eyebrows. No, we leave it alone. We don't change the notes of the bloody nutcracker. Yeah. I mean, and it's tricky. I mean, you know, I know that people loved the Spielberg version of West Side Story, but to my ear, it kind of like lost the point of so much of what made the original West Side Story work. And okay, yeah, it's more up to date. It's more realistic and it's more political, but like, the original was a fable. The whole point wasn't that it was about, you know, white people and Puerto Ricans. It's that those two words, white and Puerto Rican, could have stood in for anything. It was just about the differences. And yeah. as soon as you get more specific about the history of the moment and what New York was like at that time and what the politics were like in the Puerto Rican community and what they were like in the white immigrant community and blah, blah, blah. You take it out of being a fable and into real, real life and start questioning, okay, so this whole thing takes place over three days and like, would police actually act like this? And would they fall in love that quickly? And blah, blah. Like you start asking questions that are realism questions that you wouldn't ask of a fable. You lose the universality of it when you go to that extreme specificity in a, in a certain sense. But in film, have we really lost it? Because the original film is still there and still very relevant. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's still there. It's not ruined, so that's true, yes. For me, uh, the one I always look to is cabaret. It's like we have the Fosse cabaret and then, but every cabaret I seem to see now is based on the Mendez cabaret. Yeah. And like that, that has now become the way you do it. And Chicago and as well. Chicago, yeah, the, the, but we're doing it the Ryan King way, which is very similar, but not exact. But Cabaret is a great example because the original Cabaret is also beautiful and touching and emotional, but it's so different than what than the way Cabaret gets done now. And what you gain in this sort of like Brechtian distancing effect by doing it the Mendez way, you lose in a certain sense of there is like an innocence to the original one. And that innocence being shattered is so key to the, the way that piece works. And you know, the Mendez version worked, but it worked differently. And the new version that's running now, the Rebecca Frecknall version, is sort of like two steps removed from that original now. And it feels like it has lost its organic connection to the original piece in a certain way. Comment on a comment as opposed to yeah. a court tweet, a screenshot of a court tweet. Sorry. What's the best review you've ever gotten and the worst review you're willing to share? I can't think of a single one offhand, like a specific line. Okay. Or just like what show like, like, oh, like, yeah, like the Times really loved the, the, my lyrics in this or. I, I actually have historically not gotten great reviews and because of whom I work with, sometimes I get left out of reviews. There are many reviews of, of School of Rock that refer to Andrew Lloyd Webber's score for School of Rock. And I'm looking in vain for my name somewhere in that review and not finding it. <laughs> You know, or often they'll talk about like, oh, the clever score by Alan Macon. It's like, he just did the notes. I did the clever <laughs> part. <laughs> I seem to get pretty good reviews for Gallivant. But they seem to pick out the lyrics more often than not, which was a nice thing. In terms of bad reviews, oh my God, so many. <laughs> so very, <laughs> very many. 
any specific bon mots you'd like to throw out and share with the class or just accept? Yeah. Well, you know, in general, like when, when Tangled was released, there were a lot of reviews. Like I would say the vast majority of the reviews that said something like, well, it's not an instant classic. And that's because uh, Minkin was teamed up with Slater, whose lyrics don't reach the heights of a, you know, of a Steven Schwartz or a Tim Rice. Like, uh. And, you know, I'm really proud of those songs. And I think I think the score for, Tang- for Tangled is fantastic. Yeah. And I think in 10 years or so, when people can see it in retrospect, that will be a different point of view. But it was disappointing to have written those songs and gotten that response. But one review that I can remember is the very first review I ever got. I wrote my first Broadway show when I was 17. I was quite young. I was still in high school. And um, I wrote a show for my school, which was brought to a competition and seen by a producer who decided to produce it off-Broadway in New York uh, at a small, like, 79-seat theater. And uh, Stephen Holden reviewed it for The Times and basically did a review that said something like, well, you know, the um, the actors were terrible and the script is awful and the direction was non-existent and the sets didn't work and blah, blah, blah. And the score sounded like it was written by a high school student. And being a high school student, I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I literally took it as a good review until I was much older. It was like, oh, that was supposed to be an insult. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, getting that review literally kind of sent me on the trajectory of, and now I want to write musicals for the rest of my life. So <laughs> take that, Stephen Holden. <laughs> I, I saw listening to you speak, and I, I love your spirit about it because I do see a lot of comments like, well, if you're not a drag queen, you can't criticize drag queens. Well, if you're not a singer, you can't criticize singers kids if you're putting out art and expecting a hundred percent of people to think it's a hundred percent great fuck off get a new job because that is not how art works not everybody is going to like your art and some people are going to criticize it but you can't disregard all audiences because they don't do that as a job you're not making it for, you know, fellow singers or fellow drag queens. You're making it for the audiences. Some people aren't going to receive it. So I do really, uh, I like your spirit there that, you know, it's it's a part of this business. And I gave you some good reviews in that, but the pages that it's on are actually over there. So I can't reach them <laughs> to be able to read you okay. the good reviews that I put in there. I will say that getting awards is nice, but ultimately who really cares? It's like, you kind of know that it's yeah. a, what's the context of the moment in which you're getting the the award and getting good reviews is nice, but also it's contextual and a newspaper reviewer who's reviewing, let's say a movie doesn't necessarily understand how to review a piece of music or a song or whatever, you know, sitting in a theater where there's an audience that's either cheering or not cheering can be meaningful, but it can also be a reflection of like, it's hot in the theater or they had a bad clam before they got to the theater or (laughs) it's not the right cast or it's not the right set or it's not the right, the lighting isn't working or the sound is garbled or whatever. For myself and for pretty much every other writer I know, the moment that is the meaningful moment in your life as an artist, it's the moment where I have written the lyric and I sit down in Mencken's studio and I put the lyric on his piano and he sits down and says, oh, and starts playing it for the first time. When the song first comes into existence and suddenly it's like the lyric and the music are working together maybe even not 100 percent, but it's there and you've just created something and it's fresh and new that's the great moment when andrew lloyd weber gave me the music for till i hear you sing and i listened to that melody i was like oh i know exactly what to do with this and i was sitting there and we get to that you know he does that key change before the last chorus and i know oh this is where i go from the specific up into the general and he sat down that first time and played it and sang it and turned to me and said don't change a word. Like that was it. That was the great moment. And whatever reviews come after, whatever the life of the piece is, whatever awards you get, that's all incidental. That's all the nonsense. But yeah. the great feeling is when you've created something and you feel it spark into life and nothing's going to be better than that. So as long as you let yourself experience the full joy of those moments and that process culminating in that moment, that's what your artistic life should be about. Everything else is incidental and has almost nothing to do with you. You can enjoy it while it's good and you can disregard it when it's bad and just keep chasing the high of those moments of creation and you'll be fine. Yeah, that's it. But I don't think you should disregard the audience because they don't do that as a job. Like, well, why, are you, why are you doing it for an audience then? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, like, yeah, that's I pointless, mean, I, I find. Yeah, I mean, look, ultimately, when you're writing a piece of, when you're writing a song, 
the idea is to connect with an audience. Like that's part yeah. of what you're doing. And, you know, when you don't connect with the audience, when you feel that like that thing that you tried to convey not being conveyed, yeah, you need to go back and fix that. Yeah. That's a that, very big cue. That's on you. Absolutely. And, you know, you can't say, well, they don't get it. It's not that they don't get it. It's that the connection isn't being made. So you need to figure out why the connection isn't being made and make the connection happen. And definitely while you're writing, you're taking that into account. But I also think that there are moments when you cut your losses, when you say, all right, I wrote something, it didn't connect. I don't know why I'm moving on to the next thing yeah. and the next thing will be better. You know, for Leap of Faith, that song Fox in the Hen House that you mentioned, that was literally, I am not joking. That was the 19th song that we wrote for that spot. We wrote an entire Broadway score worth of songs to go into that one spot. And Fox in the Hen House was not the best of those 19 songs, nor was it the second best, nor is it the eighth best. It was probably the 10th best of the songs. And it's in there because it was the song that worked with the script at the moment that we had to release it into the world. But when something that isn't working right, when those other nine versions that were better songs got thrown out, it wasn't because we didn't think they were good songs. It's because they weren't working in the moment. They weren't doing yeah. the job they needed to do. And so you don't, you don't hang on to it for dear life and blame the audience or fiddle with it endlessly until you grow old and now nobody wants to do the piece. You throw it out and you write something else. You throw yeah. it out, you write something that has a better chance of connecting. It's like the, the taking a loss thing. You can't expect it all to be a hit. You've got to take your losses with your hit. This has been an amazing conversation, but it's also getting around five. And I feel like uh, you must have other things to do with your day, Glenn. Uh, as you're... <laughs> yeah. Just one last thing I want to throw in there. As I said before, you've employed Jonathan and Lizzie and Alfie. So when's it my turn? Well, mm. <laughs> what kind of a piece do you want to be in? How do we get you in there? I don't know. I write. I've, do you know how many plays I've got, Glenn? Like, some of them are here, published, because I am. I can't even see it, but that's my, um, uh -huh. The Three Little Pigs. And that's nice. my Aladdin. Uh -huh. And that's my Frosty the Showman, which I used all, like, royalty-free songs. So, <laughs> like, they're all kids' plays, but, yeah. And I got novels. I, I, I'm a writer. Anyways, so, no, you don't have to. I'm, I'm, I'm being a shithead. <laughs> Give me our bumper and then we will tell you all of our projects and things. But uh, anything we should be looking forward uh, to in the near future from Glenn Slater, other than the amazing Australian tour of Sister Act opening this month. So we have Spellbound animated film opening at the end of this year. We have yep. Clueless opening in London in late February, early March. I'm working on an Animal Farm musical with Alan oh, wow. Meekin and James Graham writing the book. And then I have another project which I can't talk about yet, but which I promise if it happens, and I think it will, you will definitely want to have me back. Yes. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. You made it out of the torture chamber in one piece, Glenn. Thank you so much for coming <laughs> back. Thank you for joining us. It's always a joy to talk to you. Uh, where can people find you on the social medias and out in the world? Uh, I'm on Instagram under Glenn Slater Lyrics. I'm on Twitter under Slater Lyrics. And I think I'm on Facebook, but I never look at Facebook. So, <laughs> but if you look me up, you'll find me. Awesome. Well done. All right. Thank you so much. Oh, we did go over, way over. Sorry if I got you into the on lyric theory. It's one of my passions. <laughs> <laughs> so when it goes over that much, do you edit or do you just kind of leave it long or? No, I, I edit every episode just uh -huh. to get rid of ums and ahs and make everyone sound human. Great. Um, mm -hmm. as much as possible but yeah it just Fantastic. depends and then they've got ad breaks in there as well but so, yeah some of our episodes have gone over but just you yeah. know there is an open invitation anytime you want to join us you're up for it again well i'm working on something that i again i can't say a lot about at the moment because it's not a done deal but it is yeah. if it happens the way we're talking about it happening will be extremely cool and that will probably be when i contact you and say let's do this yeah because there's a lot to talk about awesome <laughs> Definitely. Well, and also like Glenn, if you need a voice or anything like that, like I'm <laughs> sure it's available. Absolutely. I'm working at the second scene in New York right now over in Brooklyn. Uh -huh. Stuff over there. I'm music directing the comedy stuff out there. So if you were in the neighborhood, come on out. I'll be happy to come you in and show you everything. This is good to know. I've I have two sons who are both at school in Chicago. So I've been to Second City yeah. in Chicago probably four or five times in the past couple of years. But I yes, I should probably get out to the one in Brooklyn. That would make sense. 
Yeah. Uh, and yeah, it's just, it's lovely to be able to talk with someone who's just like, I mean, it, it's professional lyricist is such an odd job to say that you have. And like to be able to talk with someone so weird experience and who can talk about it in, uh, in a very accessible way is so nice to hear. Yeah. And again, if you ever want to talk about it, like off camera, I'm happy to like, just reach out. Don't hesitate. I will. And if you ever are annoyed by that, please tell me to stop because yes, I me too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> This has been a full day. I, I, I don't want to keep Glenn uh, longer than we yes. have today, but uh, this has been wonderful. Um, and yeah, uh, Glenn, have a wonderful day. Stay cool. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me again. Yeah, and uh, and hopefully we'll all talk again together soon. It is yes. my absolute honor. It really is. So thank you. All right. <laughs> all right. That's going to be it from us. I am Mr. J-Wags. This is Aaron Ware, the smartest oh. man in the entire village. Check below for all the links and details. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. Take care of yourself and each other, and we will see you all next time. Bye. 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 Like, like,